Hello and welcome to the 10th part of ASEAN Pacific Affairs episodes. In this episode special, we are going to discuss China's and Indian dynamics in Southeast Asia from a broad perspective with my expert guest in this field. My special guest today is Dr. Rahul Mishra. Rahul Mishra is a senior lecturer at the Asia Europe Institute University of Malaya. Uh, Kuala Lumpur. He is also coordinator international masters in European regional integration program. Prior to this, uh, he was a consultant uh, consultant with the Foreign Service Institute, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. At the institute, uh, his primary responsibilities were to coordinate training modules for visiting foreign diplomats and give lectures on Asian security and uh, Southeast Asia issues. Welcome, Rahul. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Lokman. I'm really very happy to join you and discuss issues of our mutual interests. Thank you very much. Uh, Rahul, given the Southeast Asian uh, countries' geopolitical importance, uh, what are the India and China's dynamic in Southeast Asia? Okay, if you take a long view, I think it is fairly clear that India and China are like the two pillars that have contributed to the cultural, economic and political landscape, or the ethnic, of course, the landscape of this region. Uh, over the past, I think more than two millennia, we've seen that Indian and Chinese influence have in a way shaped the very fabric of Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and I think in modern times, uh, uh, former Singaporean Prime Minister Gochok Tong's uh, description of ASEAN, uh, he used ASEAN, but Southeast Asia as the jumbo aircraft with its two indispensable wings, India on one side and China, you may like to include Japan and South Korea as well. Uh, as its two wings. So India and China as two wings of this jumbo uh, aircraft. That pretty much encapsulates the uh, the overall dynamics of India and China in Southeast Asia, how these two major powers, not only in Westphalian modern sense, but also in, in civilizational cultural sense, how these two powers have uh, interacted, shaped, and also in Britain got uh, extent shaped by the Southeast Asian region. So um, I think that has, uh, that pretty much uh, uh, gives us the overall picture. With regard to India-China dynamics in Southeast Asia, I think it's, a, it's been a mixed bag. They are considered rivals by many, particularly in uh, contemporary times, uh, post uh, Doklam, post Galwan, there is this very strong mainstream narrative that India and China are rivals and they, are, they do uh, anything and everything to um, outsmart each other on strategic diplomatic fronts. To a certain extent, that's okay. But these two powers have also coexisted in this region. And if you uh, really take a long view of history, uh, it is very clear that these are the two powers, include Japan as well. These are the powers which have stayed in, the, in this region for millennia together. So... To that extent, I think India-China relationship even today is multi-layered. It is, uh, it is multifaceted, and therefore one strand cannot really explain everything that uh, that happens in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, we can uh, come to more details later. I guess uh, you must be having questions on Myanmar. So there, I think we talk more how, despite not being on the same page, these two powers end up. Uh, adopting common, let's say, similar policies on Southeast Asian uh, uh, issues. You're on mute, Lokman. Can you hear me now? Yeah, good. Where, where do India and China differ in uh, their dealings with uh, Southeast Asian countries? Okay. Well, the differ differences are many, but uh, if we look at, uh, uh, we start with geography. So for China, uh, it is 
in the policy circles in China, in PRC and overall international relations uh, domain, it is uh, universally accepted that Southeast Asia is the prime neighborhood for China. Uh, even other regions, for example, Central Asia or um, uh, Southwest Asia, you know, uh, uh, include Pakistan, Afghanistan, that Persian Gulf, that part of the world, or Central Asia. It is very clear that compared to other regions, for China, Southeast Asia has been more important uh, economically, on strategic terms, in terms of a spread of the Chinese diaspora to this part of the world. It is fairly clear that Chinese influence has been massive in Southeast Asian region. But if you compare that with India, unfortunately, uh, the mainstream discourse today and the perceptions are largely confined to the Indian subcontinent or South Asia, if you will. So India's self-imposed role or its own role conception, let's say, as a stakeholder in the region has shaped its policy responses uh, on issues of uh, strategic economic importance in the Southeast Asian region. So India, in a way, has put a, put a cap to its own role conception and, and uh, performance and how it should behave in the region, uh, largely because uh, that's how policymakers have perceived it. Systemic concerns uh, have also played a role. The Cold War politics, India, uh, to a great extent, got capped or confined to the South Asian region, to the Indian subcontinent, uh, because of uh, what is called as a two-front uh, uh, war. And even today, th there are challenges. So. Uh, that's how South Asia became the uh, ultimate reality for India in terms of neighborhood. Uh, if you look at the uh, difference in dealings, it is true that over the past few years, India has uh, tried to re-engage with the region uh, through the look East policy, through the act East policy. And I, I'm not look, looking at the only the strategic component. I'm looking at the spread of India's uh, diplomatic activities across the region. So in on those counts, yes, a lot has happened. But uh, uh, tra India through Look East and now Act East policy, Indo-Pacific engagement has tried to re-engage the region like it used to during the pre-colonial and colonial times, uh, or even during the times of Pandit Nehru, uh, when he was the prime minister, uh, India steered the Bandung conference, uh, the Asian a relations conference started in 1947, led by uh, Pandit Nehru. Um, so India did play a prominent role back then. And the other day, um, we had an Indo-Pacific conference hosted by Chula University in Bangkok. And there, Professor Amit Acharya and I, we were discussing about how regions are artificial constructs and socially designed. And these are designed by the major powers. Major powers have decided that, look, India is part of South Asia and uh, Indonesia and the rest uh, beyond uh, uh, beyond Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, rest of the uh, up to Japan is Southeast Asia. So it's imposed on us, both South Asia as a regional construct, Southeast Asia as a regional construct. These are imposed on us and we are living with it. Uh, but if you look at the documents, Bandung Conference, for example, it, it talks about a delegation of 18 prime ministers of Southeast Asia. Uh, which, of course, included uh, India and uh, Sri Lanka, Ceylon back then, Pakistan, uh, and Myanmar are also there, Indonesia is there. So this uh, clearly means that uh, India is now trying to regain that territory, in, on uh, not just on cultural uh, and people-to-people -people linkages, but also strategic, economic, and a number of other factors. Um, in terms of difference, I think... Uh, and China has always been there. On the economic front, I think there is a huge difference in, in terms of uh, China's uh, uh, reach and China's depth in this region is uh, certainly far, far ahead and much, much stronger than India. So I think there, on that count also, India and China differ in their dealings with the Southeast Asian region. As a regional power, uh, what is the... India's maritime diplomacy in Southeast Asia? Well, in Southeast Asia, 
and allow me to include Indian Ocean also because uh, uh, all these countries are linked. Their trade routes are linked. Their uh, major economic uh, trade partners are linked to the Indian Ocean. So if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, all of them are uh, very much linked to the uh, Indian Ocean region uh, also. In this part of the world, and that's a myth, uh, again, uh, about India, that India's um, India's presence in this region was not much uh, 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 much powerful and significant in the 90s and early 2000s. That actually is not the case. India's acted as a regional uh, security provider. Uh, you remember the 2002 uh, episode when the Indian Navy escorted the american ships in the in and through the indian ocean region because uh, of course at that time maritime piracy uh, issues were pretty strong and uh, uh, americans needed uh, some support likewise another episode where india escorted the uh, ships of malaysia and malaysia was uh, well you know it <laughs> malaysia is not very sure about the american support and that's how india chipped in and india escorted uh, those ships up to the Strait of Malacca. And so India has this very uh, solid uh, reputation, you know, as a reliable partner. Um, if you, um, another example could be the Nargis cyclone uh, in 2008, Myanmar. At that time, Myanmar was, uh, like today, it was ruled by a military junta, and they were not very sure about ASEAN or Western Pass intervention despite thousands of people uh, dead in the country and uh, humanitarian crisis looming large, they flatly refused any foreign intervention, or any foreign humanitarian intervention, fearing that in the name of uh, HADR operations, what these major countries would do is they will just basically intervene and like uh, in an Afghanistan-like situation. The only country they were open to was India. They said, okay, we... Uh, we are, we are open to foreign support, HADR help uh, and uh, disaster relief and disaster uh, post-disaster recovery, but we are open only to India. And that's how it happened. So India, particularly the Indian Navy, is considered a regional security provider. And that's a very important role that India has been playing and a on number of factors. Uh, second, if you look at the India's uh, Indian Navy and its role, its its overall uh, uh, maritime diplomacy, defense diplomacy, if you wish, uh, it is based on policy of making as many friends possible. So I, I, I get reminded of this uh, very catchy phrase uh, uh, by the Indonesian, former Indonesian president, you know, you know uh, who had come up with this policy of thousand friends, zero enemy. Uh, I cannot say this for sure across domains, but if we, if I look at the role of Indian Navy in enhancing India's uh, presence as a soft power, its overall uh, image as a reliable partner, I think Indian Navy's contribution has been immense. Uh, and it is not just in terms of exchange of uh, uh, officers, cadets, training modules or joint exercises, um, PASEX exercises, uh, there are a number of domains in which Indian Navy has, has done pretty well. And uh, assistance operations have been have been very good, on uh, particularly on the uh, non-traditional security front. Avoiding confrontation is uh, is another very important role that Indian Navy has played. Uh, like we have not seen Indian Navy getting in, entangled into a sort of even accidental, you know, exchange of fire. Uh, and that's, that's very prudent. So, um, uh, Without explicitly saying it, I must say that Indian Navy officers have been really, uh, you know, uh, they are doubling up as uh, very good diplomats, avoiding conflict, but not lowering the guard at, at the same time. Um, in a number of incidents, we saw that there was a possibility of India uh, sort of getting into a, you know, a, a sort of heated. <laughs> Uh, passing by of ships, but even in those situation, in, even in those um, volatile situation, uh, 
situation, the potential of escalation, India's uh, Indian Navy and its ships, the commanders have acted very uh, responsibly. And that has led to this image that India is a power that can be relied when it comes to Shri, uh, to uh, Indian Ocean and to Malacca Straits and, uh, uh, and the areas beyond. So reliability is another important factor in India's maritime diplomacy. Uh, working with junior partners in capacity building. I think there are hundreds of documents uh, from 1947 on when India achieved its independence. And even before that, Indian Navy presence has been formidable in uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and there is no doubt that what uh, uh, media outlets such as Global Times, uh, when they call Indian Ocean as India's Ocean, I think that is also based on the formidable presence of Indian Navy in this part of the world. Uh, so yes, uh, despite that, despite its uh, very strong presence, capacity building with junior with partners, not the junior partners, but partners with limited capability, for example, Philippines or Vietnam, Myanmar, uh, India's uh, really worked very hard in, in supporting these countries and not at the same time, not elevating their capabilities to, to go fight China or any other country for that matter. These capacity building initiatives are purely for that purpose, making them capable enough to deal with HADR situation, non-traditional security situations, and uh, and fly by themselves or you know uh, stand on their feet, right? So, uh, so that's how I see uh, India's maritime diplomacy in Southeast Asia. Rahul, when we came to the Indo-Pacific strategy and rising of China, what is the role of uh, Southeast Asian countries' relations with India in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, especially in the context of rise of China? Okay, if you look at rise of China from Southeast Asian perspective, uh, I think you and I are on the ground and we know it very well that Southeast Asia is not worried about rise of China. All that they are worried about is the are the uncertainties that are uh, that have come along uh, with this rise of China, the unprecedented rise. Uh, if you talk to the moderates or you know the Dows in Southeast Asia, they would say that even this a bit of aggression or assertion on part of China is okay. I mean, they can live with it. But the fact that from 2010 on there is this incremental change in China's approach towards territorial dispute, towards its Southeast Asian partners, especially in the South China Sea, island reclamation and many other activities, Coast Guard deployment, um, uh, maritime militia, a militia that is in, in right now in, in Philippines. And we've heard reports of militia deployed in, in the EZ of uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia as well. So these are issues of concern for Southeast Asian nations now. Uh, Southeast Asia practices hedging, and that has been the rule of uh, uh, rule of thumb for Southeast Asian countries. Like they practices it very religiously. Uh, so this kind of soft balancing, soft institutional balancing, demands that you include as many powers as possible. Now, all the major powers were already there, and some of the colonial powers, Southeast Asian countries are not very comfortable with. Um, uh, and that is a reason why India is always welcome in this part of the world, in the in the, in Southeast Asian strategic dynamics. Now, with Indo-Pacific, I think issues that have really uh, uh, sort of calmed Southeast Asian down, which which were, uh, I mean, initially Southeast Asia was not very happy with this Indo-Pacific construct, thinking that it is an anti-China anti club. Uh, with India in, with Japan in, and both these countries, well, India started, Japan followed. Uh, and uh, both these Asian powers tried to convince Southeast Asia that, look, Indo-Pacific construct, Indo-Pacific region is not going to be an exclusive club. It is not going to be an anti-China club. And um, we are going to implement it for a number of reasons. I have argued in one of my papers that Indo-Pacific celebrates the rise of India. It celebrates the re-emergence of Japan. And at the same time, it also 
welcomes European powers uh, to this region again. And we are seeing how keen the European Union is, how keen Germany and France and uh, the Dutch, uh, UK is also interested. All these powers are coming back not to fight, not just to fight China. Indo-Pacific is more than that. It is not just about US-China rivalry or a Cold, Cold War 2.0. It is also about accommodating new powers to the region. And I think that is one area where Southeast Asian countries have sort of accepted it. Uh, critics uh, argue that, well, AOIP, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific is just a sort of, it's a bargain document. You yeah, There's really nothing new in it. But then, hey, please remember, this is how ASEAN works. ASEAN hates creating new institutions. They want to go, uh, they want to, uh, just stick to what they have got and not experiment too much. Whenever there is this experiment uh, with new institutions, it has to be backed by all countries and based on consensus. And that is why this hesitation. But now I think even with regards to Indo-Pacific, there are uh, there are countries which are uh, coming forward and supporting this idea. I mean, over the past three years, I've seen remarkable change in how uh, Vietnam has perceived Indo-Pacific. Initially, Indo-Pacific was a no to Vietnam, but now we see that Indo uh, that Vietnam is okay with Indo-Pacific. With Quad, yes, there are there are issues, and Quad is a totally different thing. Uh, the other, uh, uh, I think, misinformed rather uh, discourse that that runs that some are peddling is Quad and Indo-Pacific are interchangeable. No, sorry, that is not the case. Indo-Pacific is a region that is that is being designed. Perhaps it can uh, at one stage replace Asia Pacific because the very countries, the core countries that supported Asia Pacific at one point are supporting Indo Pacific, endorsing Indo Pacific now. They are propagating Indo Pacific now, Australia, Japan, the US. And now you have the European powers coming in. Even at that time, uh, Southeast Asia's response even to the Asia Pacific was lukewarm. Initially, they were not very, uh, very happy. And now the other question of how ASEAN looks at it, and ASEAN is very cagey about it. China is uh, totally against it. There again, when ARF was launched, go to all those documents before the official launch, formal launch of the ASEAN Regional Forum. It is very clear that China was equally hesitant, if not more. China, at that time, there are statements coming out from PRC uh, uh, MUFA saying that, look, we are uh, Cold War is over, but we don't want any uh, this kind of uh, security dialogue platform or whatever you call it. Uh, and this uh, seems that US is now uh, trying to um, encircle us. It's, it's trying to contain us. But over a period of time, through all those informal track two dialogues, China realized that, well, ARF is a good thing. It's, it, it is based on cooperative security mechanism, or the idea of cooperative security, and talk things out and uh, settle your disputes. So ARF helped Southeast Asia and China. It, it helped in mending their relationship. It helped China socialize with this part of the world, with this Southeast Asian, wider East Asian region. And it also led the Chinese diplomat, uh, diplomatic core understand the nuances of uh, Southeast Asian um, strategic dynamics. I think with the Indo-Pacific also similar things could be done. And, and uh, we really don't have to worry much about uh, uh, China's response at this moment. Some Southeast Asian countries understand it. And therefore, uh, this India, particularly India and Japan's insistence uh, that Quad and Indo-Pacific are different. Quad is just a multilateral mechanism to deal with China and uh, perhaps uh, put forward a deterrence mechanism. It's a very good idea. And the more we disassociate Indo-Pacific with Quad, the more the prospects for, uh, for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, another question about the uh, Southeast Asian countries. When we're thinking about uh, China's BRA, Belt and Road Initiative, and the uh, Maritime Silk Road, what is the significance of uh, the geopolitics of Southeast Asia in this? Two projects, Belt and Road and Maritime Silk Road. And uh, does India has uh, any alternative for Southeast Asia to provide? Okay, so 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I think the best response to that would be if we go back uh, to 2013 and think what happened back then. In 2013, when One Belt, One Road initiative, as it was called uh, back then, uh, the maritime arm was Maritime Silk Road, uh, 21st century Maritime Silk Road was launched in Indonesia. So the choice of place was very smart. Uh, it was very carefully uh, thought through and it worked. Indonesia was very happy with this, uh, uh, with that Chinese move. The land arm, the Silk Road economic belt was launched in Kazakhstan, similar reasons. Kazakhstan is a good friend and very uh, important trade partner. So for China, those strategies were, were very prudent. They are very grounded. India too was okay with the idea initially. And that is the reason why India supported the, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the concept of Indian, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Because if you look at the situation internationally, the difference of perception, priorities, objectives between the global north and global south, it is very clear. Today, it seems a bit a bit, bit uh, unrealistic, but 2013, 14, 15, 2010, it sounded very a very good idea, you know, that global south has its own requirements, it's, it has its own problems and uh, grudges, uh, its concerns, which global north has not been able to accommodate. So, for example, at the IMF or the uh, or uh, or the World Bank, when smaller developing countries and even the bigger ones, China, India, Russia, when they ask for uh, infrastructure uh, uh, funding of infrastructure projects, they are mostly denied. Uh, their their projects were simply turned down. So when Asia uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank was launched, the idea was that look, we need within ten years time, we need eight trillion dollars of of investment to make sure that our economies uh, of these developing uh, uh, Asia uh, remain functional. And this was a bigger concern for countries which have higher uh, population density and growth. Bangladesh, for example, or Indonesia in Southeast Asian region. Uh, Laos and Cambodia countries, LDC countries that, that had their own fights. So back then, India supported this idea. I think a critical juncture where China faltered, and I'm looking at it neutrally, is uh, the first project that was implemented, that was sort of uh, the implementation part was uh, inaugurated was in Pakistan. It was the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And if you look at it from, a, you know, from, uh, from a neutral country's uh, perspective, China couldn't really have gone you know, more wrong than that. India as an important, the second most important collaborator in the Asia, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the second highest uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the seed money, uh, uh, the contribution. There was no need to annoy uh, India at that time. Maybe China could have started with Indonesia or Malaysia or, or any other country in Central Asian region. That was really um, a very assertive, if not aggressive, move. Uh, and the CPEC, of course, passes through the disputed territory between India and China, between India and Pakistan. So that perhaps uh, started um, anxieties in Indian policy circles that, look, they, it is not just about rules and norms and transparency and so on and so forth. It is also about uh, India's territorial integrity and sovereignty. You cannot really make investments in a in a region that is disputed. And this precisely is the policy uh, that the Asian Development Bank follows. For example, Asian Development Bank would always say no to any investment in India's Arunachal Pradesh, even though it is part of India's uh, Indian territory, it is under India's sovereign control. ADB would say no to such a project because they think that, well, on paper it is disputed, so we don't want to take sides, and that's why. India expected similar things from, from China. And that is where I think uh, the situation got a little out of hand. India start, India opposed it. And uh, from that time on, uh, there's several loopholes that came up. 
uh, somehow China, uh, maybe it was overconfident, or maybe it was it was too sure about it, its uh, influence, soft power in the Southeast Asian region and Indian Ocean, that it didn't uh, look into those issues and it didn't really try sincerely to make any mid-course correction. Uh, and today we are in a situation where all important Western powers, all major international stakeholders have come up with their own policies. I mean, really, China, uh, the policy makers at least uh, must be, must be uh, you know, thinking about the whole development again and they must be regretting. It was a beautiful, initially, as a concept, it was a beautiful plan if they had followed it up with a little bit of camaraderie with India and Japan, things would have been better, at least in Asia. But overlooking and rather uh, rubbing it uh, in their noses was not a good idea. <laughs> Japan got offended, India got offended, and that's why this whole new series of initiatives, Japan came up with partnership for quality infrastructure, India has come up with Indian uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, the Sagar plan, which is security and growth for all in the region, and number of multilateral initiatives. And these multilateral initiatives are actually uh, on the infrastructure investment side. Plus, India and Japan, the two other. So, if you look at the three top three Asian powers, China is the biggest economy, most powerful, followed by Japan and India, in uh, in terms of their. Even on that count, the number two and number three they joined hands and came up with something called the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. And now they are uh, investing in a third country uh, purely on soft and hard infrastructure fronts. So railways, road connectivity, uh, development of ports, but also soft connectivity, digital issues, etc. So India has come up with, the, with the several initiatives. There is another initiative called Project Mossam uh, and the Cotton Group. Uh, but these are purely on the cultural side. It, it, it looks at India's uh, linkages with the uh, with the uh, Arab world, with the Persian Gulf. So, following the trade winds and uh, revisiting the history and uh, looking at the important but forgotten sides of our glorious history. So that, in a way, these initiatives are also good. Uh, but it's just that they are more on the cultural side. So far, I think the uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, and SAGAR are the three important uh, initiatives that India is either directly involved, uh, is steering, or is a part of. And okay. this is complemented by the uh, by the uh, other initiatives, Build Back Better uh, initiative, or uh, ASEAN Master Plan on Connectivity, uh, Indo-Pacific connectivity, there are a number of initiatives uh, uh, and the trilateral, for example, one that involves India, Sri Lanka and Maldives, for example. So uh, these minilateral, trilateral kind of initiatives on infrastructure front. So in India's uh, relation with Southeast Asia, what is the importance of China in India's strategy in Southeast Asia? You mean PRC, right? <laughs> I mean, I would like to dis, uh, make a distinction here. The People's Republic of China or China as a civilization. Uh, on both counts, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, story. China has always been important. China as China, not, not just as PRC, but even before the PRC, uh, if you want to include Taiwan today, uh, has an important role. It is uh, and no power, whether the US or Japan or India, cannot really overlook the significant role that China plays in Southeast Asia, uh, in Southeast Asian politics, in Southeast Asian trade, investment, economic front, uh, but also in overall uh, societal fabric. So for India too, it is... Uh, really impossible to overlook the uh, the important role that China plays. And here I'm talking about 
both China as a civilization and China as uh, as the People's Republic of China. Today, Chinese, so in pure uh, materialistic terms, today, ASEAN is China's biggest trade partner with $731 billion of trade. Uh, for a number of countries, more than half countries of the ASEAN Southeast Asian countries, their biggest trade partner is China or their biggest uh, source uh, for ex destination for exports is China. Uh, countries like Vietnam, despite having so much of uh, trouble on the on the territorial strategic front, uh, are at very good terms with China. So um, for India, that is a consideration. But then again, uh, India is not in a direct conflict. I, as I said early, early on, uh, one stand or one strand alone cannot explain uh, India's perception of China in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, India is in competition with, with uh, China, in, on, but only in a, in a few sectors. For example, on trade and investment, India is not competing with China. Uh, and this was very much clear uh, when um, India objected to the uh, RCEP negotiation. India walked out of the RCEP negotiations. Uh, well, some of the arguments from the Indian side really uh, held ground, uh, as in they were valid, for example, the rules of origin uh, clause. But then India had its own vulnerability, which cannot be really overlooked. Uh, just to have a trade agreement, uh, just for a trade agreement with a number of countries, you cannot overlook your own domestic constituency because, you know, this domestic politics and foreign policy, it's a two-way process, isn't it? So. So that also played a role. But having said that, on the economic front, China and India are so different that India walked away and Southeast Asian countries did not really um, worry about that much. Australia, of course, Australia felt bad and Japan felt bad. South Korea uh, also expressed its uh, disappointment and they're hoping that India would come back. Uh, a couple of Southeast Asian countries were also not very happy with the situation, but uh, Southeast Asia as a whole is not a position to bargain on the rules of origin question. So they they are just uh, even if the RCEP is a is a poor man's FTA or a, or a very fragile FTA, meeting just the the basic minimum, the essential norms of uh, uh, free trade arrangement, they are okay with it because of their trade dependence on China. Uh, and that is why they uh, they just can't walk out of, uh, of an agreement like RCEP. And at the same time, they are looking for bigger, smarter, bolder uh, FTA arrangement, mega regional F FTAs, uh, CPTPP, for instance. Uh, and both India and China cannot really, are not ready yet to get into something like CPTPP, which, is uh, acceptable to Vietnam, to, to Malaysia, right? Even on EU FTAs, European Union and China could not uh, really, the CAI uh, could not be agreed upon. And there are a number of problems over there. EU and China, uh, EU and uh, India, the FTA negotiations were stalled uh, uh, in 2013. And well, they are trying to uh, restart negotiations again, but there are so many uh, slips out there. Uh, between this, you know, metaphorical cup and the lip. Uh, and it seems very difficult. India has to really uh, play uh, the game very carefully, uh, considering that it is uh, overall, it is a protectionist uh, economy by nature. Uh, for the Southeast Asian region, they it, it works on two planks. So they are very ambitious when they look at CPTPP, but with RCEP, they are okay with whatever is provided. So they are basically acting as, as rule takers. So even though there were objections in private, uh, diplomats would agree to uh, concerns uh, raised by India, but uh, uh, in uh, public forums, they would not really uh, go against China. And RCEP negotiations, all those critics of uh, critics or uh, those arguing that RCEP is led by China, I think it is pretty clear that uh, the lowering of barriers, in terms of lowering of barriers, it was Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, which lowered it as uh, uh, by 80 uh, by eighty to 90 percent. And China was between 60 to 60 to 67 percent. 
India's lowering was 45 to 50 percent. So really, China is not the leader in RCEP, but uh, uh, but it is uh, it is an important. It is perhaps the most important player in terms of market, in terms of uh, uh, export uh, origin of uh, origin point of uh, uh, trade items, export items, and also a big market. And that perhaps drives Southeast Asian countries and other East Asian Indo-Pacific countries uh, towards China and an arrangement like this. Uh, so yeah, there are a number of uh, counts on which India cannot really match China. But when you talk about security, when you talk about particularly non-traditional security, India is really far ahead of China. Um, and that has been uh, witnessed a number of times. Even if you don't go back far in history, 1990 onwards, a number of episodes which would tell you that India was the preferred partner rather than China. Um, of course, India doesn't have any territorial dispute or claims in Southeast Asia, but that is just one reason. Uh, other countries also don't have claims. It, it's uh, perhaps the comfort level uh, between the the Indian uh, Indian side and their Southeast Asian counterparts also plays an important role. The way diplomacy is conducted, the way defense diplomacy is conducted also plays an important role, uh, a role there. India is, I think, important also because of, of history, uh, because India was one of the leaders of the non-alignment movement, uh, the third front during the Cold War. So it brought all the, uh, or even the Asia-Africa, uh, the Bandu Conference, which is basically a, a club of Asian Af African countries, so post-colonial, newly independent countries, the idea of bringing them together, and uh, Nehru coming, Nehru actually was the first one who came up with this idea of Asia for Asian. It was not Xi Jinping. So Nehru's idea of Asia for Asians is actually prevalent even today. Uh, even though Xi Jinping is using it in a different context, we understand that Asia is different and perhaps, well, his idea is that no superpower should, should be here. Uh, but uh, but that is from the Chinese perspective. So India's role in, in NAM also played an important role, giving the Southeast Asian countries the much needed confidence that they could also play a role in, in uh, international politics. So at the systemic level, the contribution of India was massive. Uh, NAM was in a way uh, India's normative contribution to the international system. And there's a lot of literature available on that. So, and that also gave countries such as uh, uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, Myanmar was one of the founding members, uh, Malaysia after Tunku Abdul Rahman. Uh, these countries played an important role and they really enjoyed it because they had their say in the international system and saying that, look, both these superpowers are, uh, well, they're they are not going by the book. They are not ethical in their practices. And is the third front, the non-alignment movement, which is uh, which is more normative in nature. It follows the international laws and rules, and we stick to the basics of modern state politics, state-to-state -state politics, which is non-interference and mutual respect, the five principles, basically, uh, plus uh, other concerns, non-use of military, etc. So yes, that makes Southeast Asian countries more comfortable. And in the Indo-Pacific, with the Indo-Pacific uh, launch 2018 on, we've seen that India has tried very hard to bring Southeast Asian countries on board, which is something that has not gone unnoticed in uh, in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, I've, uh, uh, I have the feeling that uh, India and Japan's contribution is massive in shaping up of the uh, of the AOIP, even though. Not all countries have supported it officially at the national levels, but yes, there is a lot of potential. And that's where India, Japan had trouble history, right? The, the Second World War and uh, well, the history is bad really for Japan in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are trying to, uh, to uh, really get out of that and create a new image and it's working fine. Japan is still not there though. Uh, so between uh, India, China or if you want to include Japan, I think in terms of soft power, in terms of overall image as a strategic partner or reliability, India is still uh, is far ahead of China or even Japan. And that is something that 
can uh, really be an important factor in shaping the Indo-Pacific discourse, maybe make, make it more inclusive, uh, you know, and that is uh, with ASEAN centrality. And that is, these are two important things that, uh, that ASEAN countries are looking at. Making it inclusive, that means they don't want to exclude China. And also, um, uh, the idea that ASEAN should remain at the center. So I think their concerns are taken care of uh, and the credit should go to India as well as Japan. There is another question I'm going to ask outside of the India and China, but uh, since the, the United States announced it is a pivot to Asia strategy, uh, what kind of geopolitical and political importance the uh, Southeast Asian has gained? Well, pivot to Asia policy was largely uh, Hillary Clinton's idea. <laughs> uh, and uh, she, uh, her approach to the Asia Pacific region or Indo Pacific now was very clear that it was more or less based on this idea of balance of power politics, that status quo has to be maintained if a country is, uh, is considered a revisionist state, in this case China, then it has to be uh, contained. And uh, you don't really have to contain it. The term back then, starting with Condoleezza Rice, was tither China. So make sure that China's rise is, is controlled and china grows in and rises as a, a superpower in a fashion that american policymakers or the us is comfortable with so to that extent southeast asia was seen as a, sorry to use the word but yes uh, well it's it's a cold war jargon but southeast asia was perceived as a theater and uh, that is why pivot to asia policy did not gain that kind of traction uh, relationships that were already established with Southeast Asian partners, which uh, they gained momentum. So, and there were some new initiatives also during Obama's time. For example, uh, mending ties with uh, Vietnam. That was a great initiative. But I would give for for the U.S. Vietnam uh, relation normalization in relationship. I don't really want to give credit to people to Asia policy. It was Obama's own intervention. It was his uh, style of foreign policy conduct that played a role. Going to Vietnam and saying sorry to Vietnam for, for all the, those unfortunate things that had happened actually struck the right chord. So with, uh, with Vietnam, it was, uh, it was uh, Obama's move, but Obama was the anchor behind the pivot to Asia. So just give, partly give the credit to him. Uh, on Myanmar, U.S. was a great success, and I think if if Obama was were in that position today, if Obama were the American president at this moment, we would have seen a different situation. Uh, uh, perhaps Biden, of course, is uh, these are COVID pandemic times; things are very difficult. Uh, uh, the American economy is in a sort of uh, mess there. So many things that they have to do domestically. The agenda this time is different. But if we had Obama in the U.S. at this, in White House at this time, uh, things would have been different on Myanmar as well. So people to Asia policy contributed on a number of factors. First, it widened and deepened America's co cooperation with Southeast Asian countries. The number of fronts which are opened uh, with Cambodia, with Vietnam, with Myanmar, uh, and uh, relationships were also strengthened. So, for instance, with Indonesia, uh, that was a big move. Uh, also, the uh, similarity, somewhat similarity between Obama and President Jokowi <laughs> also played a role. We, uh, I'm sure you, you must have come across those articles. I have come across so many articles that were written back then uh on how obama and jokowi are, have similar features and they come from the same uh, sort of they have a similar uh, history uh, the, the historical roots etc so that also played an important role in bringing indonesia closer to the us which was which was not really a, a prominent feature in the indonesian foreign policy uh, before that 
uh, Indonesia was has always been for a sort of non-aligned country. I mean, it is it is it remains a, a sort of policy equidistance policy of equidistance with major powers, whether it is China or the U.S. or Russia. Uh, and I think in that context, Obama's uh, diplomatic interventions played a role in bringing Indonesia closer to the U.S. Not that not very close, but yes, those initial steps were taken. Uh, and it is hoped that one day uh, the relationship will get even more stronger. Uh, Pivot to Asia policy also acted as an enabler. It brought Japan in. It brought India in. And for for the first time in in history, in let's say over a century, we saw that America doing this, really making this exception of inviting India. And Indian policymakers have not forgotten 1971 when. You know, the, when the Americans said that, look, you stop your humanitarian intervention in Bangladesh or East Pakistan, or else we send our seventh fleet. Any book on India's strategic history, India's relations with Southeast Asia cannot miss that chapter, uh, or even India's foreign policy. Uh, so, and that has a very, I, I don't know what is the best word, but maybe indelible uh, print even today, it cannot be forgotten. So, when America made this move, when Hillary Clinton started saying that, look, India has to not only look east, not just look east, but also act east, and they encouraged Japan to play a more prominent role, that was the time when this dynamic started changing. Japan was initially, for a number of years post Second World War, Japan was hesitant to play a direct role in Southeast Asia. And we saw that in how Asia Pacific, the construct was designed before that. Asia Pacific uh, without the hyphen or Pacific Asia. So Japan used Korea as a proxy to launch this idea of Pacific Asia back in 60s. Now, in comparison, 2010 on what we see is the US encouraging Japan and India to uh, leverage their soft power, to leverage their economic power uh, in case of Japan, the ODAs, and use that to bring Southeast Asian countries closer. So pivot to Asia policy is actually the origin point of the Indo-Pacific. I mean, it's a, it's a logical extension. Indo-Pacific policy is a logical extension. The flavor that Trump brought in was making it more strategic, a little more militaristic and directly targeting China. If we had Obama for the third term, we would have seen more inclusive Indo-Pacific talking about the rules and rules only and uh, perhaps countering China on that front, rather than saying we are going to counter China with this uh, Indo-Pacific. So I think on that count, uh, yes, people to Asia policy uh, contributed on a number of factors, uh, uh, bilateral relationships, uh, reprojecting uh, US in the region, and also bringing in new, uh, bringing back the old players in a new format, Japan and India. Uh, outside of the politics, uh, Rahul, what is the importance of the cultural linkage in India's relation with Southeast Asian countries? Well, the cultural aspect is, is very strong. I mean, uh, in Malaysia itself, or, or you go to Indonesia or Myanmar, the, the cultural imprint of India is so strong that if you start identifying, like earmarking things that remind you of, as an Indian citizen, to, uh, uh, to me, things that remind me of India, if I start earmarking those places and items and, you know, things, there is no end to it. Uh, and, and there are more things, I think two thirds of things you would find that have similarity with India, but they are not truly, really, they are not, you cannot, uh, well, how should I say it? They are not like 100% local Indian. They have a Southeast Asian, a Malaysian, Indonesian, Burmese flavor to it, which tells you that history is really a, a, a fine blend of cultural interactions that have taken place across centuries. And it is a process, it's a two-way process of shaping and getting shaped up. And I see this in not just in case of India, I see this in case of Arab influence also. 
the uh, the influence of um, Middle Eastern countries uh, in Southeast Asia. I see this in in case of uh, Chinese influence in Southeast Asia. So even in terms of language, and I'm sure you you uh, have friends, the Malaysian Chinese friends who don't speak the uh, you know the uh, well not the word really, but authentic mainland Chinese Mandarin are Cantonese, they have their own dialect, right? And there are so many dialects. I see this uh, similar thing in uh, in case of language, Indian, Indian languages that are spoken here. So uh, I have students who can I quickly identify, even here who can identify this guy is a, is a Malaysian Chinese and this guy is a, uh, is a Chinese, but not from mainland, or his forefathers are from some other part of uh, China. So these are interesting, uh incidents that tell you that indian cultural imprint on art and architecture culinary practices or overall societal composition indian imprint is very strong but indian imprint has also been accompanied by a number of other uh important players uh, uh civilizations china and the arab world in particular uh, other than that, I think uh, in terms of soft power, in terms of if soft power is a bunch of all of this, art, architecture, literature, uh, food and music and, and overall habits, societal uh, fabric, it's, it's more like uh, 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 there was this term used earlier in 16th, 17th century. Uh, India beyond the Ganges. Uh, so Ganges is the, the holy river in India, the largest. Uh, and this term was used by uh, a Dutch historian that Southeast Asia is like India beyond this river. That means India is like mainland India and this part is like, uh, uh, you know, the, the other India. Similar narratives are being drawn uh, with regards to China also. And of course, this idea is very political in nature, but even on the cultural part, mainland China and the other China, which is around China. So cultural influences have been strong. It's just that in modern Western international relations discourse, the Western IR domain, these things are not accounted for. These things are just given a heading, soft power and useless. Right when we talk about strategy, and this is how modern nation states are designed. This is how policymakers are designed. These are academicians are uh, are forced to or uh, are trained to think uh, on these lines, which give very little importance to soft power elements. Of first of all, soft power is not that soft. You can use it in a number of ways, but this influence is very prominent when we talk about people to people connections. Uh, and we find, like you and I, if we realize that both of us like shawarma uh, or biryani or anything else, we like we'll instantly like each other, right? And music, for example, these are very important things which mainstream Western international relations discourse does not uh, does not count. I mean, it doesn't give due uh, importance to these elements, and that is, I think, uh, perhaps the reason why. In, even in Southeast Asian discourse, uh, political, economic, cultural discourse, we see that India and China and their roles are, even the, uh, the, uh, the traders, their role is not given that kind of prominence. Uh, and we, we are made to feel like the whole thing started with British, Dutch, uh, Portuguese colonialism and the countries, uh, they fought or, or didn't fight and Second World War happened. And, from that time on, they, it's, so the impression that is given is post Second World War, Southeast Asia came into existence. That is a flawed narrative. We have to look at, at least in case of Asian non-Western countries, we have to look at their long history, not start with Westphalia because we didn't have to do anything with Treaty of Westphalia. It was, some, it was happening somewhere else. Uh, for us, for us, Pre-colonial times were the uh, the most important times. It was the golden era for India and China and Persia and and number of other countries. Uh, for for uh, for Turkey, uh, for instance, 
those were the glorious times and and those times are not just are not just confined to silk road but also to uh, to um, the asian uh, order and that asian order comprised uh, india as an important player but also included china and, uh, and turkey and iran and number of other countries so i think that is something that we have to we have to sort of bring back into the mainstream discourse when we look at southeast asia when we look at uh, the role other countries have including india have played in shaping this region we cannot just say well india has a very strong cultural uh, and soft power presence but it is not seen today no it is not like that it it has to be uh, it has to be appreciated it has uh, to be also uh, more thoroughly researched in the southeast asian context uh, i think uh, that's another important contribution that uh, perhaps uh, uh, you and i and future generation could make one one question about the defense as a historical security provider to southeast asian what is the importance of uh, southeast asian countries in india's uh, defense cooperation with the region okay so for for if you look at india's security understanding from a historical point of view during the colonial period calcutta at least till 1911 calcutta was india's capital uh, which is about 4 hours away from malaysia uh, if you take a flight uh, it is uh, roughly 500 kilometers away not even 500 from less than 500 from uh, from myanmar so for southeast asia as one of the uh, very prominent early strategist uh, km panikkar had said the defense of burma is defense of india and that point holds true even today a lot of people talk about uh, india's approach towards myanmar and why is india not uh, imposing sanctions and going to the un and doing uh, this that and everything against myanmar the reason is that india along with thailand so only these two countries right now are the uh, are directly impacted by the uh, military coup in myanmar nld political leaders majority of them have uh, have sought refuge in india in northeastern states of india or uh, the ethnic minority leaders rebel groups uh, karens and kachins uh, most of them have gone to uh, to thailand so for india security stability of myanmar for instance is a matter of direct interest it's a it's a day to day business for indian policy makers um, thailand is another very interesting example so india uh, for india indonesia thailand myanmar all these countries are very important india's security 75% of india's supplies uh, oil and gas supplies pass through malacca straits southeast asian waters and if india doesn't have a direct stake if india doesn't have a good presence in this part of the world uh, india's own security interests would be hampered and that is why the focus really uh, of indian uh, navy or indian security forces the focus really is more on making sure that your supplies are not interrupted that you stand as a as an acceptable player to every uh, country and uh, you practice a policy that is not negative as as in that is not uh, uh, very aggressive or assertive or believes in creating exclusive blocks so that is why india has been open to uh, cooperating with with all the countries of southeast asia and not siding with just one in terms of security uh, india's security partnership defense partnerships in southeast asian region are are very uh, very interesting features for example uh, for the past several decades india is uh, one of the prime def defense partners of Viet for vietnam so all the russian soviet defense supplies that uh, vietnam's got 
where uh, Vietnam is not sure about spare parts and and how to uh, and the repairs is the Indian engineers and the Indian defense of officials who are uh, involved in those you know providing those uh, spare parts and working with the repairs etc helping out with the repairs uh, training vietnamese uh, military officers in running these uh, ships boats aircraft whatever we want uh, india's role has been massive southeast asia is really the prime area for india for example with singapore it's india has policy long uh, tradition and uh, cherished tradition that india has not offered bases to any country uh, but it's it really looks amazing when you when you really think about it singapore has almost permanent base you know not a base base it's a training base uh, so for armed forces in in, in babina devalali in uh, india's biggest state in north india uttar pradesh in in Kalaikonda, you have the Navy uh, training ground, and these are occupied throughout the year. So for Singapore, all their training takes place in India. Uh, well, the most part of it, of course, they, the officers go to other countries also for exchange, etc. But the training uh, takes place in India. With Vietnam, like I mentioned, spare parts and uh, other supplies, training again. With Philippines, this is the new, the new trend that has uh, taken off, uh, and it's been a number of years now. Seven eight years when this this is more got more systematized for Myanmar the NLD government and I want to make it make that distinction here for with the democratically elected government between 2015 and 2020 India was one of the India's uh, highest the largest share of India's defense exports in Southeast Asia went to Myanmar and uh, that was mostly in areas of uh, uh, you know non-combatant areas so not really supplying the aircraft carriers and, and uh, you know the 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 tanks but uh, supplies that are essential for a military to function so mostly non-combatant uh, operations and uh, issues in terms of security i think this emerging partnership that india has with uh, with indonesia building the Subang port is also important. And that tells you a lot about how big this transformation has happened in India-Indonesia partnership. Just about 30 years ago in 1990s, Indonesia and Australia were the two countries which vehemently opposed in their parliaments, in their uh, press releases, they opposed India procuring INS Chakra. You know, uh, and uh, they said that India is going to militarize the Indian Ocean and we are against it. And they uh, released a number of uh, uh, statements critical of India. And these are the two countries today in India's neighborhood in the Indo-Pacific region, which are which are uh, very enthusiastic about working with India on the uh, on the military cooperation, defense uh, cooperation front. So this, again, is an is a an important signal as to how things have changed over the past three decades. Uh, 2022, India would be celebrating 30 years of its Look East policy. Uh, it is now called Act East, but uh, three decades of Look East, Act East put together the policy. And I think in, in that context, uh, a number of uh, uh, new things have been achieved. And this, uh, of course, is a prominent one. Uh, other than that, a very interesting episode when in the post cold war world when uh, soviet union had collapsed and malaysia was looking for uh, uh, for defense supplies india helped malaysia uh, procure a russian uh, mig and at that time india used india's malaysia used india's good offices to procure this uh, procure the mig from uh, from russia and it worked fine so in, in terms of training and capacity building programs, even Malaysia is a, is a good partner for India. So I think overall, India-Southeast Asia defense cooperation is also on a, on a solid footing. Uh, most of these cooperation mechanisms are bilateral in nature. And they are also um, 
they also factor in the comfort level with the between the partners so with india and singapore of course it is at a very high level uh, so is with vietnam but with other countries it's it's basically on what you want and what uh, the the indian side thinks is is important so mutual understanding is plays a very important role of that uh, also it is not driven by this uh, the grand strategy narratives or grand strategy considerations i don't think so uh, india's cooperation with southeast asia on defense front is largely driven by what its partners are looking for and whether uh, india is in a position to provide those uh, provide its assistance and support uh, that's how it has been working from defense to the, the economic and trade relation what is the, the the current situation between the india and southeast asian countries in terms of trade and economic relation okay so 2020 india india asean bilateral trade was somewhere 85 86 billion dollars and uh, naturally uh, singapore is the biggest partner uh, for India with, I think, uh, $23 billion. Uh, Singapore's direct FDI in India has been uh, very important, has has been significant. Uh, so India-Singapore trade relationship is uh, the most important component of India-ASEAN overall trade. Uh, out of this $86 billion trade, I think the other important countries are Indonesia by the sheer size of its economy. Uh, and uh, and the range that it offers, Indonesia being the most uh, being the biggest, most populous country, it offers a good market. It offers a range of products. Um, so Indonesia is an important partner. Third is Malaysia. Uh, we also have Thailand as the fourth place, and I think uh, followed by Vietnam. Uh, with Vietnam, of course, recently uh, a lot has changed. Uh, Vietnam has emerged as uh, I think the fastest growing uh, economic hub in the Southeast Asian region, and it is it is using that uh, beautifully. Uh, so I think these uh, are the five partners, but if you compare India's trade ties, India ASEAN trade ties with the with, with China, uh, the difference is really uh, huge. I mean India stands at eighty six billion dollars. China stands at seven thirty one. So roughly 10 times. Uh, this is also because of the fact that India's investments have not been uh, an easy thing. Being a democracy, India has to work, go through a number of channels and procedures and uh, a number of uh, bottlenecks also. In case of China, because uh, largely it is, it's, in most of the cases, it is driven by the state. It's a fairly easy process. Uh, because state decides uh, in in terms of investment state is the is the leader it, it, it always plays an important role which is in complete contrast with the us uh, of course so uh, that plays a role but chinese private companies are also important and they they make their decisions uh, uh, smartly for them southeast asia of course being the immediate neighborhood southeast asia is not only important but also the first first preference in terms of trade and uh, investment. For India, unfortunately, on both these counts, India doesn't have deep pockets. India's investment priorities, trade priorities are with the with Europe, with West. It is now with Europe, um, with the US, uh, with, the, uh, with the West Asian region, especially the, uh, the Gulf region. Uh, within the ASEAN region, there are sectors in which India is more interested. For example, uh, in terms of overall trade, services plays an important role. So Singapore naturally emerges as the biggest partner. Uh, also, the second, I think, important factor is that India's focus, in terms of trade, India's focus is not that much on Southeast Asia. And uh, that's that is not in India's handicap. It's just that it's in, in its on the economic front india in in terms of india's priorities it is not at the top southeast asia is not at the top um, so that perhaps also explains why 
India is uh, India has uh, um, still has less than hundred billion of uh, billions uh, trade with Southeast Asia, but there is a lot of potential uh, provided um, there are more linkages, more uh, connectivity between India's uh, the northeastern states and rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, this year, I, I don't think much is going to happen because a large chunk of India's trade and connections used to come from, uh, you know, that the, the to, uh, tourism and hospitality sector. So I wonder how that is that is being. Uh, the agencies are trying how they are trying to cope up with that. Uh, but uh, India offers a number of opportunities for Southeast Asian countries, and there again, unfortunately, within this. Uh, bunch of 10 Southeast Asian countries, how many of them are keen to invest in India or how many of them can invest in India? Can you expect Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar to invest in India? No, their trade is going to be more or less uh, uh, confined to primary commodities and investment. So far as investments are concerned, they are only looking at a one way investment. That is India invests in Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar, not the other way around. China has been able to do that. And India has been has not been that great. I mean, in, in Malaysia, in in Myanmar, there have been investments uh, in Cambodia to a certain extent, but uh, but that's purely a, a decision based on cost benefit analysis. So there are structural constraints. There are priorities are different, and plus the size of economy, the difference between India and China is as uh, to economic powerhouses also plays an important role there. So I would say that India, uh, we don't really, uh, we can't really uh, fully blame India for this. It's a two-way traffic, and uh, we have to look at both the sides and their priorities, their respective priorities, their preferences, and their constraints when we look at the uh, trade and economic relations between India and ASEAN. Uh, one, uh, about when we come to the South China Sea, what uh, what kind of role India can play uh, between Southeast Asian countries and China uh, over the dispute in South China seas? Well, I think one a, a question that you should add with this is what kind of role Southeast Asia wants India to play? Because we see a number of times, and that's very intriguing. For instance, Southeast Asian countries. What are they? What are they looking for? Uh, with all the dialogue partners, with all other stakeholders, what do they want from Japan? What do they want from the U.S.? What do they want from India? And that, to a great extent, decides what kind of role India can play. So, for example, the U.S., Australia, uh, Japan, at times, they're ready always ready and very enthusiastic about the freedom of navigation operations. How many countries welcome that? How many countries welcome an aggressive phone op operation in Southeast Asian waters? I don't think the count would be more than 50%. Now, wouldn't you want India to, to also join the bandwagon and do a phone op? India has done that. It is not a regular feature, but India has been, um, you know, ship visits, etc., and uh, encounters with China have happened, but uh, who's going to host you if you go for that kind of aggressive uh, phone op operation? Is a question worth our time and uh, worth uh, the time of policymakers in Southeast Asia? Uh, people keep asking, uh, uh, the media keeps asking and criticizing India for not doing enough, but what is that enough? Do you want India to uh, export its defense uh, equipment? India is doing that. India has started doing that. India was a net importer of defense equipments. Uh, and now it has started with Make in India, especially on the defense sector, offering line of credit, defense line of credit uh, in the defense sector. So with Philippines and, uh, and Viet with Vietnam, it has started with Myanmar again. So these three countries. But uh, in terms of greater military presence in the South China Sea, I think the uh, the welcome note or the invitation should come from Southeast Asia first. And there has to be a clearly defined, clearly articulated approach. 
uh, I, and that I think is a is a really a gray area when we look at collective Southeast Asian approach uh, to the South China Sea dispute. I think the the Southeast Asian countries are interested in inviting countries, inviting uh, major international stakeholders, but only for soft institutional balancing. I don't think Southeast Asia is uh, really ready for uh, all important major powers. Uh, and it is looking for, uh, for these major powers to play a stronger military role in the region. I, I, I really don't think that is a possibility. So I think that it's also shaped India's understanding. And that also, there is something that, uh, that has always been present in India's, uh, in the Indian policymakers' uh, minds, uh, because uh, the carefully drafted and crafted press releases and statements would tell you that India doesn't really want to hurt anybody's sentiments. And India wants to really play a careful, uh, uh, careful game, and not uh, impose itself onto the region. I think whenever that opportunity comes, that Southeast Asian countries invite India or Japan uh, to play, and I'm only talking about the Asian powers here, not Australia. That is U.S. and its uh, allies, and not China. Uh, I think, on that count, it is it is fairly clear. Uh, that India takes a, uh, a careful, measured approach. Uh, freedom of navigation operations are uh, going into the high seas and uh, reiterating its uh, claims as a sovereign nation in high seas with uh, access to global commons. I think India has done that number of times. Building in capacities of, of individual countries, India has done that number of times. But just going uh, to the Southeast Asian, to the South China Sea and waving your, your guns or whatever you have uh, to NR China is something that India would not do. India would play the diplomatic game. Uh, India would do what it is really good at, uh, and that is uh, include everybody and uh, uh, take everything into consideration, opportunities and threats. Uh, which is driven by the fact that it is one of the oldest players in the region. It's not a new one. It's not. Its relationships are not based on military and defense, war and uh, 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 war and uh, conflicts, and that's why perhaps that also shapes its responses. Now uh, these days, uh, the Myanmar has a very diff different position. Uh, what is the geopolitical significance of Myanmar in encounter of China and India in Southeast Asia? Sorry, uh, your voice wasn't... Uh... Uh, what is the, ge uh, the geopolitical significance of uh, Myanmar in encounter of uh, China and India in Southeast Asia? Well, Myanmar is that the trijunction of India China and Thailand, India, China, and Southeast Asia, let's call it. Uh, and that makes Myanmar more significant than any other country. In the China, India equation, Myanmar is perhaps the uh, one of the most important uh, countries. Uh, of course, Pakistan is equally important, perhaps more. Uh, but on the eastern side, on the eastern seaboard, uh, Myanmar becomes very important in that context. Uh, during the World War, during the Second World War, we saw that uh, Myanmar security uh, could affect India, and that is something that India keeps in mind always. I earlier on, earlier on, I mentioned uh, K. M. Panikkar's statement about uh, defense of Burma and uh, and uh, and India. This is also for the reason that Myanmar is the link between India and Southeast Asia. So if you were to come from Thailand to India, you have to, or any other place, and that's that's the idea behind the Asian Highway, uh, which uh, aims to link India's northeastern states with Vietnam and Cambodia at one point, but via Myanmar and Thailand. And one of the reasons why the India-Myanmar-Thailand trilateral highway, we've been talking about for donkey's years now, more than 20 years, uh, 1,680 kilometers of highway, We've, India has not been able to complete that 
or Thailand has not been able to complete that because of the Myanmar chunk. And that's the area where you have got a very disturbed law and order situation. So interruptions, disruptions in terms of uh, in, in terms of day-to-day -day life and law and order has been a major problem. And also the central government's focus uh, in a civil war-like situation, of course, the central government's focus will also be on something else, right? Uh, not on a not on a highway. Uh, resources are also limited for Myanmar. A lot of people talk about Myanmar as the centerpiece of India, China, geo strategy, geopolitics. I don't think. Uh, that really fully explains the situation. Myanmar is a is a player on its own, <laughs> and it has been uh, not really under the influence of India or China. Uh, uh, if you if you just browse through issues of Irrawaddy or any other important um, Isima, uh, the newspapers or magazines uh, past twenty years, you get to know that Myanmar's relationship with both India and uh, and China has been a tricky one. Uh, for instance, a lot of people talk about uh, uh, Hunta's very good relationship with the uh, with the PLA. But uh, I think couple, just a couple of months before the coup, uh, the chief of uh, the deputy chief of Tatmadaw, Myanmar military, openly uh, criticized PLA for supporting the Arakan army, the Rohingyas. Uh, Post coup, we had a number of uh, reports. We saw a number of news stories saying that, well, China is behind it, China is supporting it. One cannot really ignore that, or one cannot really deny that. Russia is actively actively involved in supporting uh, military junta, and there is no doubt that China is also uh, involved in that. So, if you are looking at the broad geostrategic game uh, with Russia in in the Myanmar game. Of course, it is, it is accompanied by China, uh, but that broad game includes the U.S. and the Western powers. And uh, Myanmar, like any other former British colony, also has, uh, although limited, but has the Western influence over it. The West plays a role in shaping foreign policy, uh, if not foreign policy initiatives, at least foreign policy responses of these countries. So even in case of Myanmar, West, the West plays a role. That is US, UK, European Union. Um, for Myanmar, India-China game uh, is not at the same footing. For, for, uh, for the fact that in case of Myanmar, the, uh, Myanmar has, uh, China has been supporting the rebel groups in Myanmar. Kachin, uh, we know a number of rebel groups have been trained and uh, they are supported by the Chinese side. In case of India, India has been at the receiving end. India has been the victim. For example, the Naga separatists who were trained by uh, in China during the 60s and 70s. So NSC and IK, Isaac and Muiwa were trained in China and then they came over to, uh, to India, Assam, and then they started their operations. So for India, insurgency and uh, uh, insurgent groups and rebel groups, separatist is a challenge. Whereas in case of China, due to their tightly controlled borders and uh, really impenetrable borders, uh, situation has been very good for them. It has been a plus for them. So they've been able to inflict damage on uh, sometimes to the Tatmadaw, sometimes to the rebel groups. Uh, they played uh, as they as they wanted to uh, uh, play it. So they, it actually depended on their whims and fancies. In case of India, it has been a compulsion. So part of the reason why India switched back in 90s, India uh, switched from uh, supporting Aung San Suu Kyi to the military junta was because of this reason, that there, were, there was this influx of insurgents and uh, rebel groups in the 90s. And the government decided that uh, working with the Tatmadaw was also important. It was a strategic compulsion for India. So. In the Southeast, when I look at India-China equation in Myanmar, I uh, see this difference, and this difference is huge. Perceptions are different, policies are different, their respective compulsions are different. Uh, but if you look at the broader geostrategic, geopolitical game, uh, with other two superpowers in, there is Russia and US in, Japan in as, a, as one of the top investors, 
the whole scenario changes. Uh, so during the NLD times, during Aung San Suu Kyi's government, uh, Myanmar was quite focused on Japan and South Korea and Singapore, which were its top partners. And of course, Aung San Suu Kyi's linkages with Britain also played an important role. She had a good constituency there, supporters and uh, diplomatic support, uh, political support. So um, yes, it is a trijunction, but it is uh, it is really uh, very autarkic and very uh, I would say not a controlled actor. It it plays by its wishes, and Myanmar for India's eastward engagement for India's uh, engagement in Southeast Asia, Myanmar has been a difficult uh, actor. Myanmar has been uh, perhaps one of the uh, for the look east act east policy, Myanmar has actually been a hindrance. If Myanmar was a stable country, a democracy, a stable democracy with uh, with predictable economic future, things would have been different between India and Southeast Asia. We uh, really didn't have to wait for 30 years. We are still waiting for these infrastructure connectivity, highways and roads and transport, Sitway port the Kaladan multimodal project, none of that has been completed precisely because Myanmar has not been a stable country. So uh, part of the blame, yes, goes to goes to Myanmar. Uh, and so does the uh, issues related to crisis migration, humanitarian crisis, the Rohingya migrants, for uh, Rohingya refugees, for example, uh, the influx of Rohingyas, uh, despite India, uh, facing criticism of international community. The fact is that there are 500,000 um, uh, Rohingya refugees in India, living in, in, in India. So that's a day-to-day -day challenge for uh, for the policy makers. And uh, these are things that we cannot really overlook when we look at India-Southeast Asia equation or India-China equation in the Southeast Asian context. I'm going to ask my last question for the program about the importance of ASEAN. What is the, Rahul, what is the importance of ASEAN countries uh, between the rising of the US and China competition? Well, there are a number of ways to look at it. Uh, uh, the US-China trade war uh, made at least one country very happy, <laughs> and that is Vietnam. <laughs> so the overall picture is that uh, this oh, this U.S.-China competition is actually a good thing for uh, for Southeast Asia, provided they are smart enough to make good use of this opportunity. Vietnam has certainly showed the way. Uh, I think Thailand potentially is another beneficiary of this trade war. So basically, uh, re directing your uh, or pulling your investment companies out, outside uh, out of China and, and setting up them in Southeast Asia has been one of the policies. So the biggest beneficiaries there are Vietnam, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, but only in certain sectors. So on that front, Southeast Asia has benefited. But I think nobody in the ASEAN region wants a Cold War 2.0. They don't want a military escalation or a strategic, uh, an, a, an air of strategic anxiety uh, looming, over South, looming over Southeast Asia. They don't want that. I think what they are looking for is a, is a competition, but a healthy one, a competition that is... Uh, that is controlled, that is uh, um, that is limited in nature. Uh, so that is what ASEAN is looking at, but not everything is under ASEAN's control, right? So um, so for ASEAN, one uh, cause of anxiety is that this competition, this rivalry might go uncontrolled might go out of hands and uh, lead to a Cold War 2.0. Uh, that would be a disaster for ASEAN. Uh, the second is, what if China starts uh, pushing Southeast Asian countries on choosing 
well, China would not do that, but on the economic front, for example, BRI investments, etc. With this Huawei versus the West, this competition uh, getting more and more intense, what is the likely future? I think uh, end of the day, all Southeast Asian countries have to decide whether they want to go in for Huawei or uh, like in case of Malaysia, we've, we've seen, uh, well, Ericsson got most of the opportunities. Uh, Huawei was there earlier as, a, as an important uh, investor an important partner. So how are these countries going to choose is another big anxiety for them. That will also shape their uh, uh, their overall collective response and their their future as well. Uh, to, to deal with these challenges, I think what ASEAN is currently doing and uh, where I uh, acknowledge and appreciate the contribution of ASEAN in terms of devising the uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. That's not just a document. That's also a statement, a very strong one. You just have to read between the lines a, a very strong statement that, look, we are not, we are accommodating you, but we are also talking about China here. We are also talking about inclusivity. We are, we are not saying that you create new institutions, but reform and revitalize old institutions. So ASEAN has actually worked as uh, as a, as a, how shall I put it? As, as, a, as an agent, as a tempering agent, let's say, as as a, an element that has basically blunted the uh, the responses coming from the U.S. and China. So it has basically uh, led to this uh, uh, led to this. Uh, um, softening of approaches uh, from both the American and the Chinese side. So on the Indo-Pacific uh, side, we see that the initial drafts or initial statements that had come up from the American side during Trump administration were very critical, very uh, aggressive towards China. But later on, it became more and more inclusive. Other Asian partners played their role. India and Japan certainly played their roles. But uh, ASEAN was uh, the key reason. So I think uh, even with regards to China, at one stage, I think ASEAN can uh, again play that kind of role. And uh, ASEAN will uh, play that role, I think, uh, uh, in that situation. Because uh, even for China, as uh, I mentioned earlier, for China, Southeast Asia is the most important area, most important bunch of neighbors. And uh, China would not would not like to lose any of these partners, uh, either on trade investment or in, gen in, in general, in terms of its uh, overall diplomatic relationships. Yes, South China Sea dispute is tricky. And uh, if you if you ask the Southeast Asian diplomats, I think there there's a certainly a consensus that they want a, a softer China. <laughs> they don't want. To, it cannot really accept such a strong, assertive China, and it is damaging uh, the equation. Uh, if you keep the South China Sea dispute aside for a moment, I think overall, all these countries are more or less okay. They can live with, with China. I mean, VRI investments are a problem here and there, but that can be, uh, that can be uh, resolved, right? They can talk it out. Uh, other issue areas are also more or less uh, they're not impossible to deal with. But South China Sea is reaching a dead end where even somebody as accommodative as uh, Rodrigo Duterte, the Filipino president, is finding it difficult to defend his stance on China or uh, the recent Chinese activities in South China Sea. So I think that's a, that's a major, major uh, issue that uh, China has to, China and Southeast Asian countries have to, uh, have to, sort of resolve or uh, or have must revisit for greater clarity uh, and if they are not able to uh, to resolve or reconcile their differences over south china sea there is certainly a scope for greater american presence western presence and uh, that would not be a good situation for china or southeast asia uh, but having said that southeast asia has always been a, uh, a good host to all great powers. Uh, so whatever is happening right now is nothing unusual. There is nothing unusual about it. 
we have seen the brits we have seen the dutch uh, the french uh, indian japanese americans in in southeast asia it's not that difficult to accommodate great powers in southeast asia and that has been southeast asia's biggest plus uh, historically that has been uh, southeast asia's biggest achievement so yes there are anxieties but uh, it's not impossible to deal with them they are uh, pretty uh, manageable uh, i see the biggest problem not between the us and china the biggest problem is how us uh, how china deals with southeast asia and how southeast asia responds to that so the biggest strain in your relationship is not not somebody else not an outsider but how two of you deal with it so that applies with southeast asia as well and, and china as well thank you very much uh, dr rahul for really deep information and great wisdom and great thank you so much lokman so this asian country thank you very much also for those who are uh, watching us until the end of program please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for next programs about asian pacific affairs see you in the next program thank you lokman